Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, obrigado. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organisers for the invitation to come and speak to you. Uh, and thank you very much to the technical team who have enabled me to join in the festival uh, remotely. Uh, so this afternoon, I would like to take you on a nature walk with a difference, because what we're going to do for our nature walk this afternoon is walk across the deep ocean floor, uh, starting off in Lisbon, where some of you are there uh, in the auditorium, uh, and we will take a slightly winding path across the Atlantic Ocean floor uh, to finish uh, in San Juan uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, taking in some of what I think are the amazing features of the deep ocean floor that we're now coming to understand more about through all the ongoing research that uh, is taking place in exploring our oceans. Um, and I'm very grateful um, to Rosie, the illustrator for my book, for producing the kind of map that we'll, we'll use uh, for our journey, which I'll keep coming back to um, and referring to um, as we go through today. Uh, now, this is not a journey that we can in reality take on foot as a walk, uh, but we very much these days, we do have the technology um, that allows us to cross the ocean floor uh, as if we were taking a walk. So I've used results from recent re research expeditions by lots of research teams around the world, piecing this together um, to try and give you a flavour of what it would be like if we could make that hike. It's about 6,000 kilometres, I think. So it would be a very long walk, um, but a very exciting one, uh, which is what I want to share with you. So it's a chance to really show you uh, what much of our planet is actually like, uh, because most of our world is not only covered by ocean, it's also covered by very deep ocean. Uh, the average depth of the ocean is about 3.4 kilometres. Uh, so that, that world that has been largely hidden to us until recent decades to centuries, now we're able to piece together what it's like and imagine this kind of journey uh, across it. So let's begin our journey then, imagining we are out in the estuary um, where the Tagus opens into the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see on the map from the... ...dive beneath the waves uh, down to the seabed and then start to travel across that seabed. Well, when we begin the journey, if we actually start at the mouth of the Tagus, it would actually be quite murky. Uh, we, the water has got a lot of sediment, mud, carried by the river, the estuary, as it flows into the sea. So actually, it would get dark by about 20 metres, uh, which is sort of the depth of the dredge channel there. Uh, it would actually be pretty dark. We would need to switch on our, our, our lights uh, to see what's around us, and we wouldn't be able to see very far because of all the material swirling um, in the water. And so we might dive down to about 20 metres deep, uh, very much, you know, almost in the, in the harbour there, uh, and then we start to head offshore. And the seabed would get deeper very gradually to start with. Um, for the first, oh, 40 to 50 kilometres or so, we probably really would struggle to notice it. Uh, if we were actually walking, we wouldn't notice much of a slope, much of an incline uh, under, our, under our feet. We're crossing the shallow continental shelf. Um, that's the shallow region of seabed that surrounds the land, the, co the continents. Uh, and that does gra very gradually get deeper as we come to the edge of the shelf. Uh, but again, you, yes, you, you wouldn't notice it very much. So from maybe 20 metres, where we might start our journey, uh, very much within sight of the shore. Uh, and you can see on this map here, we would cross that, that shallow shelf, the, the sort of brighter colours uh, on that map for quite some distance before it starts to get a little bit steeper uh, and we start to go down what we call the continental slope. And that's what takes us from the shallow continental shelf into the deep ocean basins. So that's the first part of our journey, crossing the continental shelf, it's quite murky, it's quite turbid, there's certainly a lot of marine life, uh, you know, there's a lot of tides and so on. Um, yeah, we're, we're very much still in the shallow world. And then we get to what we call the shelf break, this point where the seabed starts to become steeper, get deep more, more rapidly as we drop off into the deep ocean basins. 
So our journey into the deep really begins at that point where we leave the continental shelf behind and start to go down the continental slope. And although we call it a slope, the gradient, the actual degree of the slope, is on average about 10%. So to get from 200 metres deep at the edge of the shelf down to more than 4,000 metres deep, where we get into the deep ocean basins, probably takes us about 40 kilometres horizontally. So overall, it's about a 10% gradient down the slope into the deep ocean. So we would notice it if we were walking on foot, if this were a journey on land, um, but it's not that steep. Now, in, in some places it can be steep. We can get steeper underwater cliffs, but the overall change is about 10%. But there are some spectacular underwater features on that continent slope. Indeed, right on your doorstep, um, there are some amazing underwater canyons. There's the Stubel Canyon that you can see on the map, uh, indicated on the map there. Um, now, these are underwater valleys um, cut into that continental slope, and they do have cliff-like sides in places. Um, they really are very much, like, in some ways, like the Grand Canyon in the United States, but hidden underneath the waves. And they're very important conduits, very important um, passageways for all the material in the shallow seas of the continental shelf where there's lots of marine life and so on. There's lots of food being produced by seaweeds and floating algae. Um, all of that getting exported down the canyons into the deep ocean. So there's, a, there's quite a strong flow down these canyons and consequently there's some very spectacular deep sea life in those canyons. So here's one of the first things on our nature walk I want to introduce you to, deep sea corals. So we're familiar with corals that we see, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, these shallow water corals that have algae living inside them that help them to grow and build reefs. Well, once we get into the, into the dark depths of the deep ocean, uh, there's, not a, there's not enough sunlight um, for that kind of partnership with algae for corals to grow. But we still do get corals. Um, they grow much more slowly and they get their food by catching the particles that are floating past uh, in, the, in the ocean currents. So particularly in those ocean canyons, um, that's a place where we get lots of these deep sea corals. And just like shallow water coral reefs, these thickets um, of deep sea corals are themselves home to lots of other species. Um, of animals, squat lobsters, worms, sponges, you know, several hundred species associated uh, with these deep sea coral reefs in, in any one location. So they're an important habitat themselves. And we get a lot of these corals in those spectacular undersea canyons. So let's continue our journey onwards then. We've come across the continental shelf. We've gone down the continental slope, taking in those beautiful canyons with those amazing deep sea corals. Now, at the bottom of the continental slope, we get to our first, what we call, abyssal plain. And in the case of our journey today, it would be the Tagus Abyssal Plain uh, is the name that it's, it's been given. So here, the slope flattens out and the abyssal plain itself is, is like a, sh a very shallow sort of curving bowl in terms of the shape, shape of the seabed. Uh, so at its deepest point, it's more than four kilometres deep. You can see there, let me show you, a, show you a map of the Tagus Abyssal Plain. There you are, you can see the Tagus Abyssal Plain at the very centre. Uh, it's more than four kilometres deep. Um, and, you know, it really quite flat. It, it, the, the, the seabed rises gradually towards the edges of that abyssal plain where we've joined it coming down the continental slope. And what the seabed is like here, it's fine mud soft, what we call soft sediments, fine mud, a bit like a bit like clay in sort of consist consistency. But that mud is formed by the, the rain of particles sinking from the ocean above. So particularly where there are algae um, blooming in the surface waters and they make their skeletons out of certain minerals. And then when they die, they sink. That rain of particles forms this fine mud. We call it an ooze because it has that sort of consistency. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful word. Um, but fine, soft mud basically filling that, that abyssal plain basin. And then we see 
a change in the marine life. So we've met you know, deep water corals on our way down the continental slope and down those canyons. Here on the abyssal plain, what kind of life do, would we see on our nature walk? Well, we would see animals like this sea cucumber um, that you can see here. And one of the big challenges for any life in the deep ocean is, is how, to, you know, how to find food. Uh, so we, we saw those corals snatching food particles from the water that's flown by. An animal here in the abyssal plain, like this sea cucumber, makes its living by basically ploughing across that fine mud, swallowing the fine mud, extracting whatever organic matter is still remaining in those particles that have settled um, and pooing <laughs> what's left out behind it and leaving a trail of feces that we can often follow and use to identify who's, who's living there. So we'll see lots of animals uh, crossing the abyssal plain like those sea cucumbers um, that you can see there. So that's one way of making a living in the habitat of the abyssal plain. Uh, another way of making a living, finding food, is to be a scavenger. So it's not only the very small particles sinking from above that are a potential source of food, uh, but it can also be the bodies of larger animals. So a fish dies, its body sinks into the deep ocean, things will eat it on the way down, but some of the carcass will arrive on the ocean floor. Sometimes it can be even bigger things. You know, it might be the carcass of a dead whale. Uh, in some cases, it could be wood actually washed out of rivers, floating out to sea and eventually sinking. And again, there's organic matter, there's potential food there. So lots of types of uh, material sinking to the ocean floor that scavengers can make a living from. So we see a lot of species as well that are what we call scavengers, like this amazing rat tail fish uh, that you can see uh, in the picture there. And they have a lot of adaptations in their senses to detect what we call a food fall, where something like a dead fish or whatever has sunk to the ocean floor to make a meal, they need to be able to home in on it to eat it before anyone else gets there. So very much like your hyenas and so on that you get in the African savanna, they are scavengers um, like that. So they're very good, for example, at, they have very good sense of underwater smell. They can detect odors, smells, if you like, in the water. And they have behaviors whereby they will cross the ocean current to try and detect any odors that are being carried by that current from some food upstream. And then they'll swim up current and home in on that uh, in order to find their next meal. Uh, so we've got scavengers um, down there, of course. Now, wherever we've got other animals, things like what we call the deposit feeders, the sea cucumbers or the scavengers like the rat tail fish, another way to make a living, of course, is to be a predator on those animals. So as well as scavengers, we also do get predators uh, on the ocean floor here. Um, things like this spectacular tripod fish that you can see here. Now, if you're going to live as a predator, there are really two options. You can be a hunter. You can actively try and chase prey. But that requires quite a lot of energy. And in the deep ocean, food becomes more scarce. There's less food the deeper we go because it's getting eaten on the way down from where algae and so on are blooming in surface waters and forming the face, base of the food chain. So the deeper we go, the less food there is available. Life becomes more scarce. So energy is in short supply. Potential prey items are maybe further apart. Being a hunter is maybe not such an effective strategy for a lot of deep sea predators. But a lot of them instead, therefore, the other option is to be what we call an ambush predator. And basically to sit or lie in wait for potential prey to come nearby, you can detect them with senses, and then strike. And that's what this tripod fish does. So it's called a tripod fish because its fins are modified to form a tripod that allows it to sit on the ocean floor. So it doesn't have to swim. It can just settle on its fins on the ocean floor and it will point its head again into the prevailing current, the, the current that's coming past it. And it's got feelers and so on and very good senses to detect potential prey, and then it will strike and make a meal of them. So we have what we call the deposit feeders, you know, plowing through the sediment to extract food from it. We have the scavengers, we have the ambush predators. So that's just some um, of the marine life that we'd encounter if we were crossing 
uh, that Tagus Basin Abyssal Plain. Now, if we were in the middle of the Tagus Abyssal Plain and we took all the water away and we turned to the south, we would see in the distance, we would see the peaks of some underwater mountains. So that's the next thing um, I want us to take in uh, on our journey as we, as we, as we head south. Um, so just before we leave the Abyssal Plain, just to mention the other place that animals can live, not only on the surface of the seabed, but actually in the mud itself as well. So when we collect a sample of that mud um, using various devices, you can see a picture here of what we call a, a core sampler that collects a sample of deep sea mud and we look through them, we find lots of small animals like this nematode worm that you can see. Um, uh, if I click that now, that should show you the nematode worm. There you go, there's the nematode worm. So there's actually a life in the mud itself as well. Um, and lots of species, lots of different species. There's very high biodiversity here compared to other deep sea habitats. So let's carry on our journey in the Tagus Basin. Let's now take a, a bit of a detour. Let's head south towards this undersea mountain that we could see in the distance if the water was, was taken away. And it's really quite a spectacular um, undersea mountain. It, it's called the, the Gorringi Bank or Gorringi Seamount. It's actually two undersea mountains with a sort of ridge um, in, in between them. Uh, and it rises very sharply from the surrounding seabed. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the slope up the sides of it on average is about a 25% gradient. So if we were on foot, this really would be a climb. We would be really noticing the climb as we went up here. It would be a bit of a scramble uh, in places to climb up this undersea mountain. And it rises from about four kilometers deep at the base. And the peak of the underwater mountain is just 50 meters beneath the waves. So it rises nearly four kilometers up, a really spectacular um, feature. And it's what we call a sea mount. Now that's a, an undersea mountain and there are we 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 call something a seamount if it's more than a kilometre tall than the surrounding seabed, and there are more than thirty nine thousand seamounts like that dotted around the world's oceans. Now, because the sides are quite steep, the particles raining from above can't settle. Okay, to form a muddy seabed, they just slide off. So the sides of this undersea mountain. Are, are very rocky. So it's very different habitat to the abyssal plain that we were just crossing. So instead here we have a rocky sea floor and that means we get a different kind kinds of marine life, different animals thrive here. Um, in particular, animals that are what we call suspension feeders. So like those corals that we met in the undersea canyon, these are animals that make uh, a meal from taking the particles that are drifting past in the ocean currents and feeding on those. So we get a lot of those types of animals. And those types of animals, they need to grow up into the water away from the seabed because that's where the flow is stronger, where they can get more food. And in order to grow up from the seabed, they have to anchor their stalk, you know, their, the, 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 their long form of their body. They have to anchor it to something so that they're not getting blown over um, by the ocean currents. And that means that we get a lot of these types of animals, these suspension feeding animals, where there's rocky seabed, because the rock is something that they can attach to, they can cement themselves to. So you can see this spectacular, uh, what we call iridogorgia, it's a type of deep sea coral, um, lots of little polyps there, all feeding on the current as it, as it flows past them. And you can see the, the base of that, uh, it looks like a little blob of cement, and that's actually where the base of that coral stalk is stuck onto the rock to hold it fast in the, in the current flowing by. Now, actually it requires obviously quite a lot of energy, quite a lot of food to grow a stalk and so on and, and produce that kind of a structure to help filter a meal from the ocean currents. So another way you can make a living is very cheeky, if you like, um, climbing up someone else's filtration apparatus um, and uh, using it to catch a meal um, yourself. So that's what you can see in the picture here. Here we've got um, a kind of sea star. It's what we call a brittle star. Um, and it has climbed up a deep sea coral to where it can feed on the particles that that coral is filtering, is catching 
out of the ocean current. So it's kind of stealing a meal um, from that coral by climbing up it. Uh, so we see that happening uh, as well. So really spectacular undersea mountains, um, lots of this type of marine life um, ar around them. Um, and that's another really important habitat lots of these undersea mountains around the deep oceans. So let's leave the Gorringi Bank behind. We'll now start to turn, we'll go south of it, we'll turn to the west, just to give you some idea. Here's a quick map. Um, there's another little abyssal plain just the other side of it. So you can see Tagus Basin, we've come south uh, across um, the seamount there. We're in another little abyssal plain, then let's turn west. We'll go through some more seamounts, we'll weave our way between them. And eventually we cross a very, very large uh, abyssal plain called the Madeira uh, abyssal plain. So after you know, some more abyssal plains, some more seamounts, we get to cross the big Madeira abyssal plain, which is quite a large proportion of the Northeast Atlantic here. Uh, so we work our way across that. It's very much like the Tagus plain, soft sedimented seafloor. The depth isn't changing very much. It's pretty steady around about 4,000, just over 4,000 meters. 4,200 or so as we cross that plain. And it would be a long walk. It would be very much like walking across a desert with fine sand. Over here, it's fine mud. Um, and again, we'll see much the same in the way of marine life that we met earlier. We'll meet sea cucumbers. Here's another example of some sea cucumbers. Uh, and I've chosen these because they illustrate one of the other challenges um, of life, for life, in the deep ocean. We've talked about the challenge of finding food and the different ways that different types of animals do that in the deep sea. But another challenge is finding a mate, because as life becomes more sparse, as animals are sort of further and far farther apart uh, in some deep sea environments, meeting a member of the same species as you, but the opposite sex for reproduction, can be a bit of a challenge. So we see a lot of adaptations in deep sea animals to overcome that challenge of finding a mate. And these sea cucumbers, these are a type of sea cucumber called Pararyza. And they have a really, I think, really romantic solution um, to the problem. Because when one Pararyza sea cucumber is making its way across that mud of the abyssal plain, it's eating the, the mud to feed on and so on. And in the dark, it's making its way across there and it meets another Pararyza. Well, when they meet, they stay together, they, they pair up. And from that point onwards, they then travel across the abyssal plain side by side. And you can see that in the tracks that they leave that we can see in sea floor photographs. So you've got a picture of the pair of the sea cucumbers there. And actually there, you can see they look like railway tracks. You can see two tracks together. And that's where two Pararyza have come together and now they stay together. So when you find a potential mate, keep them, hang on to them, okay, stay close to them. Uh, and that's a solution that they have to that challenge uh, of finding a mate. So I think they're a very romantic uh, species in the deep ocean there. So we would see marine life like that as we work our way, maybe 800 kilometers or so across the Madeira Abyssal Plain, a long journey across the Abyssal Plain. And then on the far side of it, as we are always traveling west in general on this journey, we would see some more underwater mountains. And one in particular that I think is very spectacular that I'd like to take us past. Uh, so there is an undersea mountain called the Great Meteor Seamount, uh, which is well worth stopping and having a look at um, on our journey. Uh, and it's exciting for a lot of reasons. A little bit of history. Why is it called Great Meteor Seamount? Where did the name come from? Uh, well, it was actually named after uh, an expedition that first studied it. That was an expedition by a German ship called the Meteor, which gave the seamount out its name, um, 19, in the late 1920s, 1925 to 1927. Um, the Meteor set out to explore the oceanography um, of the Atlantic. And the Meteor was a, an important expedition of discovery um, because it was one of the first research ships that had a new piece of technology um, in the form of an echo sounder. So a way of mapping the undulations of the seafloor and indeed detecting where there's an underwater mountain like the Meteor Seamount um, using sound by bouncing sound pulses, listening for the echo from the seabed and the time it takes for that echo to come back tells us how deep the water is. That was a new technique um, back then um, and it revolutionized the mapping um, of the deep ocean floor. 
Um, so previously, uh, the only way to find out how deep the ocean floor was, indeed how the Gorringi Bank was discovered, um, that, was, that would be by lowering uh, a rope, a line with a weight on the end and sort of feeling for when it's not swinging anymore and, it, and it's touching the bottom. Um, and then how much rope have you put out is roughly how deep the sea, you think the seabed is. It's not very accurate and it's very time consuming. So kilometres of rope to make a measurement uh, and and then you know having to haul it back in again and that's one measurement in one place you know whereas with the echo sounder sending a sound pulse just waiting a, literally a matter of seconds for the echo to come back and then you've got a measurement of how deep the seabed is there so the meteor is really important um, as an expedition because it crossed the atlantic 11 times and made 67,000 uh, 67,000 measurements of depth uh, when it did so. And the record until then on an expedition was, you know, until then was, was a few hundred um, typically. So it was a major step forward in being able to map the ocean floor um, with that technology. And it gave us uh, the name for the great meteor seamount that we could see there. So what does it actually look like? Uh, I'd like to show you some images now um, from a research team led by Joanna Savier and colleagues who studied uh, the Great Meteor uh, Seamount recently. So it's it's quite flat topped. That's the first thing you'll notice in that top image that you can see there. There's kind of a flat top to it. Um, that's because in the past sea level has, has changed and, and this has actually been an island and been eroded to give us a, a flat top and now it's beneath the waves again. And one of the really exciting discoveries um, that Joanna's team um, made uh, was looking at the marine life in different bands with depth up the seamount. And again, it rises from 4,000 metres or so up to about 150, 200 at the top. And there is a band where there's a lot of these amazing glass sponges that you can see here. Really another spectacular kind of deep sea life, another filter feeder, suspension feeder, um, like the, the other marine life that we talked about on the other seamount. So really exciting uh, place. So well worth taking in the Great Meteor Seamount on our journey. But let's now leave it behind. Let's continue our journey further west. And as we leave the Great Meteor Seamount behind, we would notice that instead of coming back down to an abyssal plain now as we move west, instead the seafloor is becoming a little bit more hilly. It's getting a little bit more undulating, a little bit more bumpy. And we're starting to cross a, a big region of, of, of bumps that we call abyssal hills. Uh, they are typically two to five kilometres in sort of length and 200 to 500 metres of rise and fall as a hill. So, you know, rolling, rolling hills gradually getting shallower as we go west from about 4,000 metres deep up to about 2,000 metres deep as we head west again over about 800 kilometres. Um, so you can see that in the map there. We've got the Great Meteor um, Seamount that we're leaving behind and it starts to get bumpy as we come up those abyssal hills. Now these abyssal hills are actually the most abundant surface feature of our planet. Okay, We get them all around the centre of the oceans as we'll see in a moment uh, and they're actually, you know, the most abundant geographical thing on Earth. Um, but again, we're not, you know, we, we don't think about them because they're hidden beneath the waves. So the other thing that we'll notice, not only do we start to get this undulating seabed of these abyssal hills, but there's now less mud, less sediment. It's, it becomes a rockier seabed. It's not steep slopes. It's just that the, the mud hasn't had time to accumulate to build up a thick layer of fine mud here um, for a reason that will become apparent in a moment. So the seabed gets rockier, it, we start, it starts to become more undulating, and eventually we start to approach a really spectacular feature, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay, so coming up from 4,000 metres as we come to the west, to the crest of this ridge, to maybe a kilometre and a half deep. Um, so gradually shallowing as we come up the abyssal hills till we get to this, this ridge. Now, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is part of our planet's greatest geological feature. It's part of the global mid-ocean ridge. Um, so this is sometimes described as a chain of undersea mountains or volcanoes. That's not quite accurate as to what it is, but it's really a volcanic rift, as I'll show you in a moment. And it runs all around the planet like the, the seam on a tennis ball. 
So you can see a map of it here. And this is one of the first global maps to show its full extent. So it comes down through Iceland. It's the mid-Atlantic ridge while it's going through the Atlantic. Then it turns the corner, goes into the Indian Ocean. We've got ridges in the Indian Ocean. It comes up through the Pacific. Uh, it's about 60,000 kilometers long. And it is our planet's greatest geological feature. We weren't aware of its full extent until 50, 60 years ago. Um, thanks to the work uh, in particular of Marie Tharp, who you can see here, who was a pioneer in, in this discovery. Um, Marie Tharp had the job through the 1950s into the 1960s. She actually started actually in the late 1940s, piecing together the echo sounder traces from ships crossing the ocean. And she noticed whenever she put one of these echo sounder traces, you know, sort of plotted it, whenever the ship crossed the middle of the ocean, there was this ridge. And she could see not only was there a ridge always in the middle of the ocean, but at the top of the ridge, there was a little notch. There was what looked like a rift valley. Uh, and that was a really key discovery because that helped us to understand more about plate tectonics, how the plates of the Earth's crust move around. Here, they're actually moving apart. OK, they're rifting apart in the middle of the ocean. So there is a rift valley where those plates are moving apart. Uh, and that's actually where new Earth's crust is being created by volcanic eruptions. Lava, magma is welling up as lava at the seabed uh, to produce new ocean crust as the plates gradually move apart. And in the mid-Atlantic where we are here, they're moving apart at about the same rate that our fingernails grow. So it's very slow, but it's all it's happening all the time. And eventually that's how the continents are drifting around around the globe. So this was a really key discovery um, in, in terms of understanding how our planet works. Marie Tharp did really key work piecing it together from those echo sounder traces. So let's now take a look in more detail at that mid-Atlantic ridge. Uh, so we're now going to climb up to the actual rift valley itself. What would it be like if we were doing that? Well, it, it is a rift valley and it's got very steep sides and the valley is a, at least a kilometre deep, in some places a little bit deeper. So we would climb up the edges of this ridge and then we would have to drop down into the valley to cross it. So we would actually need ropes and things if we were doing this, if this were a journey on land, on, on foot. Um, very steep slopes. Uh, what does it actually look like? Here's a picture um, of Mid-Ocean Ridge to show you, and you can see how different it is to the abyssal plain. What you can see here, these lumpy sort of rocks are what we call pillow basalts. They are lava that has erupted from the ocean floor and solidified because it's hit cold seawater, uh, in, frozen into these shapes. So it's very rocky. There's very little sediment because this is new seafloor. This hasn't had time over thousands and millions of years for the rain of particles to build up a covering of mud. So it's very rocky. It would be a real scramble down into that rift valley. The rift valley itself um, is uh, probably, it varies a little bit, but uh, about uh, maybe about 25 kilometers across. Okay, so we would drop down into it, and then go across it. Now, as we're crossing it, if we're lucky and we do it in the right place, we would see one of the other spectacular features um, of the ocean floor, uh, these things called hydrothermal vents. So these are undersea hot springs. They are just like the geysers, the hot springs that you get in Iceland on land, but here they are beneath the sea. And instead of erupting steam, um, because of the pressure of all the water above, they erupt um, a very hot fluid it doesn't turn into steam because the pressure stops, stops it from boiling. Um, and it's very rich in dissolved minerals being carried by that hot water out of the ocean's crust. Uh, so these spectacular, we nickname them black smokers because what comes out of them looks like black smoke. But those are actually particles of minerals um, that, were, that are forming as that mixes with cold seawater. So the, the very hot, um, where this hot fluid is coming out, 400 degrees C is the hottest I've me ever measured at one. And they're little clusters of these sort of geysers over the area of a, a couple of football pitches, that sort of area. And then it's tens or maybe even hundreds of kilometres to the next set of hot springs. So they're dotted along the Rift Valley um, and around each one, spectacular marine life. So I spend most of my career studying what lives at these hydrothermal vents. Here's what we would see crossing the Atlantic, where we're crossing it. If we came to a set of hydrothermal vents, 
one of the most uh, abundant animals uh, would be these kinds of shrimps. So here they are on these mineral spires that form from the hot fluids, a um, couple of stories high, and amazing, you know, thousands, millions of these shrimps swarming around them in the warm fluid. Uh, so here's a close up of one of those shrimp to show you. Uh, it's, it's a kind of shrimp called, the scientific name is Rubicaris. How does it make a living? It gardens bacteria on the gills. Underneath that carapace, those gills and mouth parts are covered with bacteria. The bacteria use the minerals in the fluids coming out of those vents as an energy source. The shrimp scrapes off the bacteria and eats them. So they garden bacteria on their bodies um, to, to live. Uh, so again, a different way of making a living there in the deep ocean. So we've made it to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge all the way across from Lisbon. Let's now carry on our journey um, towards Puerto Rico. So very much actually, it, it's kind of a mirror image. So we leave the Rift Valley, we climb back out of it. We then come down the sides of the ridge. Uh, uh, and as we do that, again, it's abyssal hills. And you can see that from a map here. You can see the bumpiness of the seabed. Uh, and we start to have to swing a little bit southwest now to get to Puerto Rico. So again, we cross 800 kilometers, more than 800 kilometers of abyssal hills. And eventually we come to another very large abyssal plain. Uh, and so while we're going down the abyssal hills, again, there's not much sediment. We're seeing a lot of those suspension feeding animals like the spectacular deep sea anemone that you can see on a rock here. Then eventually we get to an abyssal plain. And in the case of our journey, it's called the Nares abyssal plain, the next big abyssal plain that we need to cross to get to Puerto Rico. So after there's some more abyssal hills, we come to another big abyssal plain. Here you can see it on the map. We're now turning south uh, to, to, towards our final destination of Puerto Rico here. The Nares abyssal plain, um, very similar to the others that we've seen, similar kinds of marine life um, that we've already seen and, and, and I've talked about. Um, just to mention as we cross the Nares abyssal plain, where did it get its name from? Um, it was named after George Nares, who was captain um, of an expedition of a ship called HMS Challenger, um, which was a, one of the first around the world voyages um, exploring the deep ocean, 1872 to 1876. He was a captain at the start of the voyage. The Nares Abyssal Plain um, is named after him. Challenger didn't have an echo sounder. They measured depth by lowering that the weighted line. Um, and you know they charted around this area to show that there was Abyssal Plain here. They collected seafloor sediments. And they also discovered the next feature that we're going to take in as we approach Puerto Rico, kind of save some of the spectacular stuff till last. As we approach our destination, we before we get to Puerto Rico, we would actually drop into the Puerto Rico Trench. So this is a much deeper bit of seabed. The Nares Abyssal Plain, about four kilometres. The Puerto Rico Trench dropping down to eight kilometres deep just before we start to approach um, the island itself. So a spectacular ocean trench where one of those plates of the crust is, is, is kind of being pushed down beneath another to give us this kind of ocean trench as the plates move past each other. But it is a place that people have explored. Um, so we're familiar that people have been to the Marianas Trench in the Pacific, which is a little bit deeper. This is the deepest part of the Atlantic, the Puerto Rico Trench. Um, and a French deep diving batiscaf took people to the bottom of the Puerto Rico Trench in 1964. And you can see it there, the, the Archimedes. So, um, uh, a really important undersea craft in that early uh, history of deep diving um, submersibles, as we call them, for science. So the Puerto Rico Trench, what's it like at the bottom, just to give you an idea? Well, the trench itself acts a bit like a funnel. So the soft sediments raining from above actually get sort of concentrated as they go down, down to the bottom of the, the, the center of the trench. So there's a lot of soft mud at the bottom. Animals like this amazing shrimp that you can see with its very long limbs picking its way over the soft, soft mud. The trench itself is quite interesting. Again, it, it's not like we see in the movies. Sometimes it doesn't have cliff-like sides. The overall, there are places where there are steep walls, but overall, again, it's about a 10% 10, 10 down angle into, into the trench. And if you were standing at one side of the trench, you couldn't quite see the far side of it. It would be over the horizon to you because it's actually that wide. Uh, now, not only little particles raining down into uh, our trenches, also I'm afraid to say we also find a lot of rubbish accumulating in the same way, getting funneled into the deep ocean trenches. Now, these pictures here are not from the Puerto Rico Trench. I haven't explored the Puerto Rico Trench myself. They are from the Cayman Trench in the Caribbean, which I have spent time exploring. 
um, but they just show you some of the rubbish that we get in deep sea trenches. So that plastic bag and that beer can are from 2.3 kilometers deep. Uh, that other drink can and that bottle are from five kilometers deep. So our rubbish ends up getting funneled into the ocean trenches as well. And we already see it there um, today. Just one of the impacts that we have on those deep sea environments. So to finish our journey, we would climb out of the Puerto Rico trench. We're heading south now towards the island and the capital of San Juan. Um, some spectacular seabed on the way out. There's this amazing uh, place called the Amphitheatre Escarpment. I don't unfortunately have any pictures of it. It hasn't been um, very much explored, um, but very exciting where blocks of the kind of rocks that make up the islands of that chain have actually slid into the deep ocean. So there would be some spectacular geology. There would be spectacular marine life, um, suspension feeders and so on, like we saw um, in those underwater canyons, I'm sure. And eventually we would start to surface, hopefully within sight of the beautiful citadel um, of San Juan. And that would be the end of our journey. So I hope that's given you a flavour of the diversity of different environments, different habitats that there are in the deep ocean. If we were to take that kind of a walk um, all the way from Lisbon to San Juan, that's what some of the things that we would see. That's what it would be like. Some of the things we would be able to take in. So the deep ocean is not one environment. It is not one habitat. It is just as rich and varied uh, a natural world as the world above the waves with our forests and our tundras and our savanna and so on. There's just as great a diversity of habitats, different types of life thriving in each one um, that we can see in the deep ocean. So I hope you have enjoyed that journey. And I have to confess at the end, I have only taken you across the ocean floor on what would have been a walk. It would have been just as exciting to fly and look at what lives in that vast other world of the interior of the ocean where life is just floating around. And again, we would see some spectacular animals there as well. So there is still plenty for us to explore in the deep ocean. And it's a great time to be an ocean explorer. Thank you very much.